Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. Today we celebrate the feast of the three holy hierarchs, Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, and John Chrysostom, all of whom lived in the uh, fourth century. St. Basil the Great um, is, was, uh, just to give you a little brief overview of his life, St. Basil the Great was born around 330 and somewhat of uh, aristocrat, however, raised by a very pious Christian family. And of his family, uh, another four individuals, or I believe three individuals, are saints within his family. Gregory of Nyssa is one of them, his, his mother, and anyway, so he was brought up piously Christian. However, interestingly enough, at that time, especially in his class, it was very common not to baptize your children. You would raise them Christian, but you would wait until they were in their mid-20s, essentially until they had sowed their wild oats, so to speak, and then they would be baptized or more dedicated in the church. So St. Basil was giving, given the best education, and he saw piety his whole life, and he became a great uh, public speaker, um, also the equivalent, a little bit of the equivalent of what we would say as a lawyer, um, going to some of the best schools that could be gone to at that time, um, learning, uh, well, I mean, particularly emphasizing his ability to sp public speak and rhetoric and those in philosophy. And he had all that and he was good at it, but it sounds like in somewhere around his mid-twenties, he had an experience in his room where a divine visitation, the very light of God, overshadowed him. And he was given a choice to con con continue with the life that he was living, which was dedicated to essentially worldly glory, to obtaining wealth, to be continuing within his class, uh, his aristocratic uh, class, whatever, however, you know. I don't do English well. <laughs> or it's too early, whichever. Um, so he has this revelation and he repents. This is his conversion experience. And having read the Gospels and being well aware of them, one of the first thoughts he has is, well, in the Gospels, there's a lot of people who get rid of everything they have and follow Christ. And so he gave away everything and he followed Christ. And in his life, he was famous for founding hospitals, founding orphanages, uh, founding uh, monasticism, being one of the founding fathers of the monastic practices of that time. For uh, in his, all the skills he learned in the world were used as a, uh, he actually was one of the people who was negotiating between the Arians and the Orthodox before the Second Ec Ecumenical Council to try to find some sort of compromise. And he passed away before the Second Ecumenical Council, and of course, um, but his effort was, was known. And his sanctity was celebrated within his life. St. Gregory the Theologian has a little bit of a similar story. He's raised and he's educated. I don't believe, um, I believe his father, excuse me, I'm mixing my saints up here. Um, there's three today, so I'm not supposed to mix them up. Um, he is, just like St. Basil, educated. Uh, he is top of his class, so to speak. Philosophy, rhetoric, um, again, speaking, uh, being a lawyer, being able to um, uh, litigate and stuff, which is all this is oratory stuff, but also very clearly has a heart of a poet. Now, St. Gregory in, uh, impulsively decides to go to Greece where he wants to learn some more and he gets stuck on a ship. And for 20 days, he's, it says that he's stuck at sea on the ship. Um, the way he relates it, because he tells his story, actually, and writes it down, is that the fresh water was knocked off the ship somewhere in the storm. 
And so for many, many days, they were without fresh water. And for 20 days, they were being tossed about like they were in a washing machine with total blackness, lightning. Needless to say, St. Gregory has a conversion experience. He sees his life, as they say, when you're dying, your life flashes before you. He sees this and something in his heart says that he needs to dedicate himself to the church and dedicate him to a life of service of Christ. And he prays his prayer. He has his moment. And the storm ends very briefly the next day. He goes and he fulfills. He ends up being the patriarch of Constantinople. At one time, he presides over the Second Ecumenical Council. He's a poet, but he's also salty, meaning that he... I, one of my memories from seminary was the professor reading one of his farewell or, orations to the Second Ecumenical Council because he left, somewhat in protest maybe, but definitely frustrated because it wasn't going the way he thought it should go. And essentially within his uh, oration, he lets them know how he feels about them, the bishops. So, you know, in a poetic way, of course, you know. <laughs> in a poetic way. He goes on in his life to retire and write poetry, and he's called a theologian because within his writings and within his poetry, we have some of the clearest and most beautiful expressions of the Trinity, of our belief about the three persons of the Trinity, and of the experience of what it means to encounter God. And that is, St. John, the theologian, one of the reasons why he's given the title theologian. Anything that you read by him is profitable and beautiful and, and well done, even in most, even in translation. St. John Chrysostom is unique in that he is, seems to be not only raised a Christian, but there's no mention of a later conversion or <laughs> baptism. His father dies at a young age, and he's left with his mother. And again, as an aristocrat, is educated. He's not educated in Athens, but he's educated in Antioch. And in his education, he again becomes a great public speaker. At one time in the church, at a young age, he is called forth to be a priest. And the story says that he ran away from it that he actually fled so that he wouldn't be ordained a priest. And if you read the story, it's kind of funny because he was going with two people he knew, friends. So they went and got ordained. They, he disappeared. Yes. He wanted to be a monastic. But he had a mother, and so he cared for his mother until she reposed. He went on to be a monastic, but was so strict with himself, he hurt himself. Over time and over his career as a priest, and then, as, and then he became the patriarch of Constantinople. He's called Chrysostom, which means golden-tongued, golden-mouthed, because he was able to eloquently preach. His homilies are both... Um, they're very beautiful. I mentioned the other day in a sermon that um, on the weekday uh, that, that St. John Chrysostom's homilies, when you read them now, are very applicable to our lives. Uh, you can kind of get a snapshot of the early church. You can see how full they were. And if you think this homily's long, <laughs> sit down and read a homily by St. John Chrysostom and realize they didn't have television back then. <laughs> He's a very forceful personality. He deals with the problem of Arianism within, the, the Constantino, uh, within Constant, Constantinople. He then eventually is sentenced to death, but is rather exiled, and he dies in exile. The story of today's feast, now two of our liturgies, we have St. Basil's liturgy, St. John Chrysostom. It's also said that Gregory the Theologian 
had a liturgy that celebrated in Alexandria. I read that last night. That was the first time I'd heard of it. The story of today's feast is that apparently in the um, 1100s, there was a fight that broke out organically among Christians. And it brought me back to my childhood. I, I did a form of karate when I was young. And, um, and in martial arts, uh, maybe you saw the karate kid or something, but I don't know if you know it, but my karate is better than your karate. <laughs> and there seems to be a general attitude, and I'm, this is partially true and partially joking amongst martial artists, that their style is the best. Well, this same thing happens in the church with sinful people. And so you had some saying, I'm under the John, St. John, I'm a Jonite. I'm a, a Gregory writer, however they said it, and I'm, I follow St. Basil. And somehow took these fathers who had similar skills and similar uh, talents and, and similar ability to to preach and, and teach and live the faith and somehow pitted them against each other. And it was beginning to create a faction in the church. This became serious enough where it was becoming a, a rather, rather substantial problem. And you might remember in the early church, the apostle Paul has to tell the disciples in his churches that don't say that you fall Paul or Silas or so-and-so. The faith is about Jesus Christ. It's not about me. So the bishop of that time has a dream, and in the dream, they come to him, they reveal themselves to him and say, look, we're neither opposed to each other, we're in complete unity, and we're in unity in Christ. We love each other. We're not, no saint, neither three of us is better, more powerful, more saintly, this sounds ridiculous to us, but it was what it was. None of it were equal in Christ. The bishop comes back and reports this, and apparently this is the beginning of today's feast day. It's why we celebrate the three hierarchs together. They also somewhat become a patron, uh, patron saints for education, which you'll see especially within uh, in Greece where uh, well, we even see it in uh, OCA at the uh, Saint T uh, Vladimir Semer Seminary. They have their three hierarchs chapel because that's a place of, of education. We have, and we have been given many worldly talents. Some of us converted as adults. Some of us are being raised in the church. All of us are going to be exposed to the, what they would call the treasures of Egypt within the early church. In other words, our society has a lot to educate us with and a lot to give us. But ultimately, we're called, like these three holy hierarchs, to at some point, and we will be challenged to at some point, to prioritize the church and the spiritual life. And to take whatever we've been given, whatever God has given us, whether it's worldly wisdom or whether it's churchly wisdom, and to put that in action to serve the body of Christ and to serve one another in the body of Christ. They did it with their unique abilities, which were aristocratic, uh, expensive education, and unbelievable talents that may be beyond what most of us have. We do that with the small things or the great things that we've been given. The other lesson that we can take from today's feast, because we live in a very strange time, is that we shouldn't be like the people of the 11th century and begin to pit Christians against Christians. You know, there's a lot of internet personalities. I'm on the internet, actually. Um, I don't have a big following, I don't know why. <laughs> but I did grow my hair out and it didn't work, I tried. Anyways, um, where there are a lot of internet personalities and there are a lot of um, priests, very dedicated priests, um, who, for whatever reason, tend to attract a following. And in our sinful nature, it's unfortunate, you know, I don't know, you go back to the early church, you remember that Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles, 
Peter's apostle to the Jews, and occasionally they argued, but ultimately they were one. They were together. They weren't opposed to each other. But in our modern age, oftentimes it seems as though personalities oppose one another. We say, we hear people say the OCA is bad, the Greek church is good, the Russian church is bad, the Ukraine, and go into these sorts of polemics and then tie it to teaching. And we have to recognize that whatever creates disorder in the church is sin. That it comes from an egotistical place, that it's not healthy. So, like St. John and St. Gregory and St. Basil, our fathers, the holy fathers of our day and age, need to present themselves as unified in Christ, pursuing a common goal, the sanctification and our salvation. And as Christians, as pious Christians, we need to be able to discern and realize that we follow Christ and that we are not about following personalities. Because it's when we follow personalities that we begin to oppose each other. When we follow Christ, we are following what the fathers were following when they're pursuing. So, may these three holy hearts pray for us and help us to use our gifts and talents that we've been given to build up the church. May we have the same conversion experience as St. Basil and St. Um, Gregory. And may we be given the ability to discern and to see through some of the various personalities of our times and to squarely put our trust in Christ and pursue him at all costs so that we can become sanctified and glorified with these saints as well. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. Yeah.